everyone. Uh, my name is Kyle, and I'm an artist. Um, I've only been working with these themes for uh, maybe three or four years now, um, but I got started in early 2009 when I read a blog post from a friend, Dan Paluska, um, called Thoughts on Total Openness of Information. Uh, and he wrote, what if all your private information was public? Just the information, not the control. Uh, this means your bank, your bank statements are public, but not the bank password for transferring funds. Is it possible that your information is better off in the hands of the general public than it is in the hands of our large, fallible institutions? If everyone has your information, does that make it less prone to theft? Do enough people care to make it repair itself the way Wikipedia repairs itself? Does society function better if we actually know the truth about each other? If all the bad people have your info, will you have your identity stolen? But if everyone already knows your info, how can it be stolen? Um, this really got me thinking. He's kind of a philosopher and an artist and an engineer. Um, so he's tying a lot of different themes together. And I think he's not just like mindlessly accepting the possibility of a surveillance state. Um, he's actually asking us to ask ourselves, uh, are there any social benefits to openness that maybe we hadn't considered? Is there some way of owning this? Um, so I decided to answer these questions for myself with a project called KeyTweeter um, that I started right after I read this post. Uh, for one year, I posted everything I typed directly to Twitter. Every 140th character I entered on my laptop was instantly posted as a tweet. And this included emails uh, to friends, Skype conversations with my parents, uh, my entire master's thesis, uh, <laughs> waking up and going to bed with my girlfriend, <laughs> everything. Uh, and uh, it did not include any passwords or credit card numbers or social security numbers. Um, and that's because I started to realize there was this difference between uh, information in a sort of general sense and control information or control of information. Um, that one of these things uh, is kind of about who you are or who you've been. And the other thing is more about who you're becoming or who, who you might become or having control over your identity. Um, and I wasn't so interested at this point yet in letting people become me. <laughs> um, yeah, so <laughs> one of the things I learned from this project is that um, uh, I don't know, there's, there's normally this freedom that's associated with anonymity. Like, if you're more anonymous, then you're, you have more freedom. Um, but I found a different freedom from this project, which was um, the freedom of kind of being honest with people. Um, I found that it, knowing that everything I was doing was posted completely in public, um, I didn't have any secrets to hide. There were no games to play with people. I didn't have to figure out, like, keep track of what I'd said to whom. Um, I could just kind of be myself and be okay with that. But I. I'm not really espousing this idea of like, oh, you should have one identity, you know, you should have this consistent thing that doesn't change. Because over that year, like, I changed a lot. Like, from the beginning to the end, a lot of be beliefs I had cha uh, changed, a lot of things I work was working on changed, my friends had changed, my girlfriend had changed. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, so I, I guess what I'm saying more is like um, maybe there's a different kind of uh, freedom and openness that's, uh, than the freedom that we associate with anonymity. Um, maybe there's a place both for anonymity and for openness. Um, after finishing KeyTwitter, I got really interested in uh, some ideas around, uh, sorry, some, uh, some other ways of approaching um, sharing or openness of kind of what was happening in my sort of private, personal digital life. Um, I started thinking about visual corollaries, like tearing away bits of my screen as I was using it. So whenever my mouse moved over something, then it would tear away a slice and kind of scrapbook it and post it online. Or uh, whenever I, whoops, whenever I clicked on something, advanced too far. There we go. Whenever I clicked on something, it would uh, store a 32 by 32 pixel icon of what I'd clicked on. And I could see over the course of the day, you know, a little bit of iTunes, a little bit of YouTube, a little bit of answering emails and writing code. Um, and I was posting these with friends. And I'm, I'm still working on an app that allows people to see what everyone else is clicking on at the same time. Uh, after that, I worked with a friend, Theo Watson, on a project called Happy Things, where uh, it was just a screenshot directly of your screen with you kind of composited in the corner. But the screenshot was taken and posted online whenever you would smile. So whenever you smiled at something on your screen, it would automatically post it. And we got everything from uh, you know, cat photos to animated GIFs. Um, uh, one guy just smiled at the Nick Wikipedia page for Nicolas Cage. <laughs> I, I think it's pretty funny, too. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, but the most helpful uh, thing I discovered uh, was actually in this 
time lapse of uh, myself actually turning it around instead of looking at the screen, just looking at uh, myself with the webcam. I took a photo every minute. Um, and uh, I was expecting that maybe there would be something about my face that was revealing my interactions with other people that would kind of do the same thing that KeyTweeter had done, that would reveal something about the way that I was, I was working with people or that the way I was using technology, the way technology was mediating my interactions. But what happened instead is I noticed I just always have this face, like... <laughs> It's like this computer face. It's this blank stare. Um, and, it, and it's there throughout the whole day. I think one of these photos I'm smiling, kind of. <laughs> but uh, this really freaked me out. I thought, is this really like what technology is doing to me? Is this, uh, like, is this what's happening on the other side of the screen? Um, and I thought, well, what I should do is I should go do some research and um, find out if other people have this face or not. So I went to the Apple store in Manhattan, um, tried to find a nice public space to take some photos, which happens to be legal, as was discussed earlier. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, I found out it's the exact same situation for everyone else. I automatically posted thousands of photos to Tumblr over the period of a few days. Um, and everyone's wearing the same face. We're all looking at computers the same way. Uh, but Apple didn't really feel the same way about this as I did. And uh, <laughs> a few days after posting the video, kind of wrapping up the project, I got a visit from the Secret Service at 8 AM. And they executed a search warrant, confiscating my laptop. Um, and anyway, so I moved on to the next project. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've been exploring a lot of things with face tracking uh, for maybe a year up to that point. Um, so I started working as, as just as they confiscated my laptop, I started working with a friend, Arturo Castro, um, on this idea called face substitution, where we were replacing people's faces in real time. Um, uh, I was. One of the reasons we were interested in this is just it was really cool looking effect. It was like really surreal to see your face substituted in real time with all your expressions and movement and motion. Um, and uh, we were just kind of psyched for this crazy ex effect that we were getting. But um, the more that we played with it, we started to see these repercussions kind of back to these other themes of uh, privacy and surveillance. Um, we started implementing this idea from Philip K. Dick called uh, the scramble suit, which is this um, replacement that's a composite of lots of different people simultaneously. So you get the impression of talking to someone without actually knowing who you're talking to. Um, but my favorite project uh, was from this student, Keith LaFuente at CMU. Um, I posted all the, Arturo and I, we posted all the code for face substitution online so anyone could kind of take this technique and appropriate it and reinvent, uh, you know, how they wanted face tracking to be used for themselves with their own uh, creative projects. Um, and uh, Keith did this really great project called Mark and Emily. Um, where he takes on both the roles of Mark and Emily, a uh, generic and normal couple, uh, maintaining a long-distance relationship um, over Skype. And he said the work was inspired by a conversation with his mother who encouraged him to continue abiding by heteronormative standards even after coming out to her. Um, and uh, so he sees that as, as a critique of the limitations of heteronormality. Um, and he's using this technology to, like, you know, replace his face and give him this kind of mixed identity that allows him to address something that's very personal to him, um, but also kind of this, uh, like, interesting cultural and political thing. Uh, and this is, like, the way that he wants to use face tracking and the way he wants to use these technologies that are normally associated with surveillance and have privacy concerns for the rest of us. Um, uh, yeah, and it's especially interesting to see Keith... Uh, doing this work coming from CMU. I think this was about a year and a half or two years ago um, because it's one of the, CMU is one of the places where some of the most um, important face tracking research has been done recently. Um, Alessandro Acquisti uh, did this wonderful project where he determined that by taking photos of you in a public space, he could cross correlate that to information taken from uh, public digital information and determine your social security number. Um, so I'm just curious, actually, who knows this research? Anybody here? All right, cool. That's the most I've seen in any crowd. Um, <laughs> that was almost half the audience. <laughs> um, yeah, and this, I, I don't think most people realize, like, how direct this connection is. Um, but this is, like, the other end of the spectrum of, you know, we have some artists on one end hacking on possible creative applications of face tracking, and then we have... Uh, kind of security researchers on the other end or computer vision researchers hacking on, on this approach. Um, and we don't see this kind of technology very often uh, in, in public spaces, uh, or we don't maybe just know 
maybe we don't know the capabilities of this technology. You know, it's not super obvious, like, uh, you know, with the more digitally oriented stuff like uh, people are doing Prism or the more like physically oriented stuff like Trapwire. It's not always obvious like what the exact capabilities are. They're kind of, sometimes they're hidden in secret documents and sometimes they're, you know, leaked. And, uh, but there are some things that happen in public spaces like uh, SceneTap has been used for a few years now um, to figure out, you know, who, who is going to the bars, what is the makeup of the people in this bar. You can check in advance to find out, you know, is this going to be a good scene or not. Um, uh, I don't know, like, it's, I think we need artists to kind of engage with these technologies and figure out, uh, um, not just the security researchers, but also we need some artists to engage with these technologies and figure out how to respond to them. Maybe the right way is like, you know, thinking about uh, your, like, your identity as a queer person related to these technologies, or maybe it's thinking about like, just wanting to uh, avoid this technology. Like, uh, maybe we should all just start walking around with our head tilted at 15 degrees. This is an artist, Aaron Barthel, that I work with, um, demonstrating a very simple hack. Uh, and this is a movement currently in Berlin. Uh, people are walking around with their head tilted at 15 degrees to avoid face tracking. Um, <laughs> Or we can go a little further. Uh, there's a CV Dazzle from Adam Harvey. Um, this is another technique for avoiding face tracking using kind of creative makeup application and fashion. Uh, <laughs> this is, again, from an artist. Like, this is a reinterpretation of these same technologies. Um, I really like projects like CV, da CV Dazzle because they represent this creative response to this technology rather than just, you know, denouncing it or complaining about it. Um, and I think uh, some other Berlin-based artists uh, Daniel Vasiliev, uh, Julian Oliver, Gordon Savicic are doing really interesting work in the space of um, appropriating surveillance technologies and reinterpreting them. So Newstweak is an example of one of their projects. Um, they have a small router that they put in the corner of the room at a cafe and it takes uh, all of the unsecured wireless traffic and it does a man in the middle attack on it and uh, it... <laughs> It replaces news headlines, basically. So you're browsing the cafe at internet and you just discover suddenly, apparently Assange is wanted for the Defense Department. Um, <laughs> uh, this is still running in many cafes around the world, actually. Not many people uh, know about it. Um, <laughs> it's been running for a year or so. Um, yeah, they've, they've also done this project, uh, the Transparency Grenade, which is really nice, where um, uh, this device intercepts unsecured traffic, but instead of transforming it or um, translating it, it just keeps a record and archives it for later analysis. So it's meant to be triggered in uh, private meetings. Um, it's a tool for leaking data, sort of like surveillance, this idea of reversing surveillance technology to observe the people in power. Um, yeah, I, don't, I can't imagine actually sneaking this into a meeting, but <laughs> I think that's part of the point. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, one, one more reversal, I'll finish with this. Um, two years ago, it became clear that, uh, two, three years? Two years ago, I think, that Apple was uh, storing GPS locations of every iPhone and sending the, the data back to their servers every now and then without really clear justification. Um, they, received, they received really heavy uh, criticism for this and they responded by um, <laughs> making the log a little shorter. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I really like the kind of artistic response to this or the creative response to this, which was Open Paths, which was uh, partially Jer Thorpe worked on this. Um, and uh, the idea was just collect all that data and use it for, um, for research purposes so that we could kind of take the data that was uh, kind of already being um, acquired, like uh, collected by Apple and um, do something useful with it, like we were, everyone was just speaking about in the last few sessions. Um, uh, it's interesting because Google was actually doing the same thing at the same time with Android phones, um, and they were using it to feed all of their uh, traffic data on Google Maps, um, but for some reason it didn't get as much attention after it became clear that they were doing this. Um, yeah, and I only found out about that from a friend who's a security researcher in LA who told me that Google was tracking your phone location for Google Maps when he decided that he wanted to get home from work fast one day, so he spoofed all the traffic so that <laughs> it would look like the road was really busy and no one took the road. <laughs> <laughs> <I> th 
I think I think he, that's why he didn't really write a write a report on it at the time, because <laughs> he wanted you know if he really needed to get home one day he would just you know press the script and then um, anyway. Uh, <laughs> All these, all these things considered, uh, I don't think there's much of a question, like someone just said during the last session, like there's not, uh, this isn't something that we can like stop at a dead, uh, we can't like completely reverse what we've done already. Um, I don't think there's a question about the future of anonymity and surveillance. Um, it's only going to get harder to be anonymous. Um, there's too much of an incentive to know where people are at all the time, <laughs> uh, to know where people are and what they're doing at all times. And uh, when you're in a position of power, it's tempting to believe that um, the more information you have, the more understanding you have about the people that you're observing. Um, uh, yeah, one of the most dangerous parts for me, or most uncomfortable parts for me about the Secret Service investigation was um, the feeling that I knew they were, they were uh, watching my email. They asked me at one point, what is your password for your email account? And I didn't know at the time that I didn't have to give it to them. Um, so I just said, okay, you know, here's my password. And, uh, but I really, I stalled for a second because I'd done key tweeter and I thought, you know, this is control information. This isn't just this isn't just who I've been, this is actually the point where they get to decide who I am in the future if they so choose. Um, this is like the thing that determines who I am. Um, so I stalled, but I gave it to them because I wanted to see what would happen. <laughs> um, it turns out nothing really happened as far as I know. Uh, <laughs> um, but I, it, I think it's really, uh, dis it was really disturbing for me to think that, you know, they were distracted by this huge collection of information and tried to find uh, something that made sense into their conception of how they wanted me to be as an individual. Um, yeah, anyway, uh, I'll just wrap it up. The, the, I think the only answer with all of this is to embrace surveillance um, to creatively, integrate surveillance into our lives. <laughs> and uh, spend some time being anonymous, spend some time oversharing, and figure out for ourselves um, kind of where the, where the boundary lies for us, um, what the boundary between private and public is for each of us. Um, and I think if you're in a position uh, to make decisions about how people are exploring these topics, uh, are treated, <laughs> uh, just remember that artists and troublemakers are always going to be important for pushing these boundaries and uh, helping us understand where things break and where they work best. Uh, thank you very much.